You've probably heard this at the beginning of one of your favorite songs. You may already know that's the signature sound of multi-platinum producer Dijon McFarlane, or better known as DJ Mustard. But what most people don't know is a majority of the hit songs you've heard with the Mustard on the Beat tag, they actually have another producer. His name is Mike Free, and we'll get to him in a minute. My producer Mike, Fr Mike Free, his name is Mike Lee. I quickly got interested in this story, and I wanted to know more about who this Mike Free person was. I came to find out their collaborations go much further than I could have expected. Over 30 of DJ Mustard's biggest songs were co-produced by Mike. I just couldn't get over the fact that I had never even heard of this guy, yet I've heard every single one of these songs he's helped create. I searched for articles online about the two, and unfortunately, I stumbled upon some skeletons in the closet. Apparently, Mike Free is well aware of the fact that most people do not know who he is. I don't know who Mike Free is. I'm the platinum producer from Los Angeles, California. And he wasn't okay with it. I guess the two had been in a legal battle for quite some time over proper compensation and credit, but things weren't always like that. Apparently, the two had met through Mike's girlfriend at the time. And she was like, mentioning like, oh no, I got, like, I want my bro to DJ, like, his name is Lester, he's so tight. And I was like, for sure. They got to know each other and started working together. Mike says he would start the beats usually with the West Coast bass and a melody, and he would send the beats to Mustard. How did that work? Sometimes, you know, I'll start off the beats, and, well, all the time I'll start at the beats. Who would add snares, hi-hats, and finishing touches. Needless to say, this went on for quite some time and they would produce tracks for people like YG, TC4800, and local LA artists who at the time were not well known. Well, what it sounded like was just a sound. It was just a woo woo and that was it. It wasn't until 2011 that they got their big break. Mike sent a bass line and a melody over to Mustard that would become the beat to Tyga's Rack City. We all know the song was a hit, and it would put them in the conversation of pop and producers. Well, actually it would only shine light on DJ Mustard's name. You see, when we look online, there's only one producer's name that comes up. And when we listen to the song, well, there's only one producer tag on the beat as well. Now, if you didn't already know, normally when two producers collaborate on a beat, they will both place their tag at the beginning of the song. So where is Mike Free's producer tag? By now, if you haven't noticed, I'm finding more and more questions than I am answers. Once again, I found myself online trying to figure this out. In an interview with Complex, when asked if Mike had been paid for Rack City, he simply stated that it was a mixtape track and you don't really get paid for mixtapes, which in my experience isn't true at all. Yes, you may not be able to collect royalties off songs depending on the agreement between the artist and producer because they know mixtapes don't bring as much revenue as albums, but that doesn't mean they're not willing to purchase the beat outright for exclusive rights for one lump sum of money up front, which I assume is probably what happened seeing that Tyga is a pretty well known artist at the time and he was signed to Young Money label. Mike obviously realized after the fact that he deserves some credit because he stated he's going through some legal issues over Rack City now, which at the time of this article was 2015. But that was four years after the song had come out. So what could have happened in those four years that would cause him to finally speak up? Well, the two ended up scoring their first album placement with 2 Chainz hit song, I'm Different. Mike would send the melody to Mustard again, and he would finish the beat. He says for this song, he got his percentages. But there was a little bit of shaky stuff involved with that as well. But I will say I think this is the point where Mike started to realize he might have been missing out on a lot of credit. He decided to keep quiet about how he felt, because he didn't want to ruin his friendship with Mustard over money. He continued to work with Mustard all through 2014, where they literally controlled 50% of the songs played in clubs, radio stations that year. If you think I'm kidding, just take a look at some of the songs they both produced. I can personally remember hearing all of these back to back. That year was crazy for them. Well, again, maybe just for Mustard. Yeah, yeah. Mustard! Know, DJ right. Mustard! DJ Mustard on Shark Gang. The one and only. Mustard is back, yo! Because at the end of the day, he's the one who we all probably give credit to for these tracks. Which I have to say is unfortunate because Mike Free is equally responsible for the hit songs. At this point, I decided to take things into my own hands. I still felt like I needed more answers. I wrote Mike Free on Instagram. Knowing he would probably take some time to reply, I turned off my computer and headed to bed. When I woke up the next morning, I opened my Instagram DMs and noticed a reply from Mike. Unfortunately, my excitement was somewhat short-lived. 
Mike informed me there wasn't much he could say about the situation with him and Mustard due to legal reasons from their lawsuit in 2015. I didn't let this stop me though. I was determined to get more information. I had a good talk with Mike and I slowly started to get more and more out of him. I asked him questions of why he never put his producer tag on any of the songs he helped with. I was curious if it was because him and Mustard had some type of agreement where Mustard would essentially be the face of the brand and he would help in the background because that was the only assumption I could think of. I mean was it one of those things where he assumed Mustard would take care of him so he wasn't worried about branding his own name? He replied, yeah, I didn't want a tag to be honest and we was homies so I didn't really worry about the business side when we started. Now a lot of you are probably thinking this is dumb. Why wouldn't you worry about the business side of things when you're making hit records? Well you have to remember, Mike and Muster were just friends doing what they love. And sometimes when you finally have your breakthrough, you're not fully experienced or ready to understand everything going on. So I can kind of understand where he's coming from. Prior to all this in an interview with DJ Mustard, he was asked who got him into making beats. I thought this was weird because he said Mike Free got him into it. I actually like my little bro taught me how to use it. He was making beats. And the same dude, Mike Lee. But then years later in another interview, Mustard would say Ty Dolla Sign was actually the one who showed him how to make beats. In beats at, at the time I was just um, DJing. Ty showed me like the ropes of making beats. I figured out my own program. I just thought this was weird because the second interview was years later, obviously. And this was after Mike and Mustard had their falling out. It was almost like he disowned him. I kind of figured the answer of this already, but I decided to ask for fun. He said, Ty Dolla Sign provided the format, like what drums to use and tempo to use. I gave the unique sounds and melodies. Every single beat we started was in my computer with a unique melody, chord progression, bass line, or all three. Rack City was an accident. I never planned on doing that. It just happened. Same with I'm Different. But when I'm Different hit, I started to figure out my formula. Just Read Up 2 was where I really got my shots up because I had just dropped out of college and they had a studio house, so I was basically living in the studio. From there, I started cranking out all the hits. In a way, I felt like he was actually the one who started the sound of the West Coast bass that we all expect from a mustard beat. So I asked about this as well, and he responded, well, I was inspired a lot from Tupac's early albums and bass lines. DJ Quick also, but that was when I did Paranoid, Show Me, in 24 hours. I was listening to deep house music from the 90s, and I'm always listening to music getting inspired. Right now, I'm listening to reggae from the 80s and 90s. I obviously blurred out the artist he mentioned name because I don't know if it's something I or even him is allowed to speak about yet. And I don't want to mess up an opportunity for him as he is still producing for a lot of big names to this day. Mike went on to tell me he has a lot of respect for Mustard and in fact despite all their disagreements he said I think his business moves are highly underrated and overlooked. He's a great businessman. It made me happy that Mike didn't seem to have any hard feelings for Mustard and it looks like he's moved past all these issues. One last thing he asked me was to only tell this story if it's in positive light. Initially, when I started research on this video, it was just going to be a video essay on DJ Mustard's upcoming. It wasn't until I started digging that I ran across this story. And my whole intention of this video isn't to tear DJ Mustard down, but in fact to shine some light on Mike Free. I felt he deserved to be in the conversation of people who paved the way for the iconic West Coast sound that we all know today, and also for giving us some of the biggest records of the decade. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, consider liking and subscribing, and let me know who you guys want me to do a video on next.